May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. They're reading verses 1 through 13, where we read it as follows, the Word of God, which will be the basis of the message this morning. Jesus said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, the bridegroom of the church, their fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating and preserving, triune God. Jesus here tells a story, we call it a parable. He likens the kingdom of God to something in an earthly way. A comparison, you might call it. Well, he talks about a Jewish wedding. You have to understand how Jewish weddings went back then. Uh, first of all, the bride did not choose her husband. And in those days, the husband did not choose the bride. The choice was made by the groom's parents. The parents would select uh, a woman, a lady from the area or wherever, and uh, that would be the bride for their son. And when the parents had made the selection of the bride, they would go to the bride's parents and negotiate. And there was always a price to be paid for the bride. And the price could vary. It depended on the negotiation and kind of depended on the value that was set upon that particular girl. For example, the daughter of a king would demand a great price. Uh, maybe even a city. But it could be money, it could be land, uh, whatever they negotiated, the groom's parents would pay for the bride. Well, when the agreement was made between the parents, that was it. Uh, it was announced to the public, they are now betrothed. And they are as good as married. It's set. But they didn't live together right away. They still lived at their respective uh, houses. Uh, and it could go on this betrothal period. Even though they were married, this betrothal period could go on for a long time. Could go on for years. But at a time set by the groom and his parents, uh, the groom would set forth from his parents' house where he'd been living, and with his friends would go to the bride's parents' home, and there she was waiting with her friends. And uh, then uh, when the groom got there, he would pick up the bride with her friends, and all of them would go together back to their house, and there would be a great wedding feast. And this would go on for days, maybe even weeks. It was the greatest feast probably of their lives. It was something they would never forget as long as they lived. 
And that's how Jewish weddings occurred back then. Well, this is the context that Jesus tells the story in. And, of course, he's not just instructing about Jewish weddings. He has a much higher meaning for this parable. Because he's stating, as other places in the Bible state, God, Jesus, is like the groom, the bridegroom. And, and, and his bride is the church. The believers, the holy Christian church on earth, the, the believers in Christ, his disciples, those who trust in Jesus as their God and their Lord and their Savior, put all their trust and hope in him alone. That's his bride. And God the Father, Father of God the Son, he chooses who his bride will be. The Bible talks about the doctrine of election, predestination. That's what it's referring to. God chooses his son's bride. God chooses the believers. We don't choose God. He chose us. And after he chose us, he paid the price for us. Remember, the value of the bride is the price that is paid. The price... God paid for us to win us back from Satan, from death and eternal hell. That price was so great, it was God himself. God the Son coming down from heaven to become a human being, a true man, so that he could suffer and die after living a perfectly sinless life under the laws of God, die for our sins in our place on our cross. Fulfilling the justice of God perfectly and cleansing us from all sin with his blood. And then rising on the third day to prove it's all true and it's all so. And he's worthy of our full trust. This is Jesus, our Savior. He is God himself. Jesus said things that only Jesus as God could say. No man would say the things that Jesus said. For example, Jesus said, even as he was visibly present on earth, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. No man can say that. Only God can say that who's om omnipresent. And Jesus also said things like, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. No man says that. Only God can say that. But these are things Jesus said to prove he is God. What is the price that God paid for our salvation? His own life, the life of God himself, coming down from heaven and dying on a cross for our sins. Do you see how much God values you? His bride? So, we are bride in this parable. Jesus is the bridegroom. Someday, soon, our groom will come for us, his bride. He will take his bride home forever. This is the betrothal period, you might call it. But Jesus will come soon and take us to heaven, our eternal home, where we will live with him face to face forever. And will it be joyful? Will it be joyous? like a joy you've never felt before, like a great wedding feast, eternal in the heavens, that will go on forever. Now, now that we see the layout of this parable, who means what, Jesus goes on. He talks about uh, the bride and her friends. And in those days, there was... Uh, it was dark at night. They hadn't discovered electricity yet. And the only way you could see at night in the dark was with candles or lamps, oil lamps. And so you had to have these ways of lighting up the darkness. Well, uh, Jesus talks about how the bridegroom was delayed in coming. He didn't come during the day. 
He didn't come when they had thought he would come. In fact, he was delayed into the dark hours of late evening. And so darkness fell over the bride's uh, house where she and her friends were waiting for the groom to come. And it was dark, and they had brought their lamps so that when the groom came, they'd have their lamps and they could go out and meet him and go in this great wedding procession back to the house. So you needed a lamp. You had to have a lamp or you couldn't join the wedding procession. You couldn't uh, find your way to the house where the great wedding feast would be held. Now it tells us in this parable, Jesus said, all of these ten friends of the bride, all of them brought lamps. They all took lamps, but of the ten, Jesus said, five had forgotten to fill their lamps up with that all-important oil. They had no oil with them. All they had was the lamp. Jesus says they were foolish. Look at verse 2. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now remember, these ten virgins or these ten maidens, they represent the Holy Christian Church, or, or they represent at least the outward visible church. Five of them represent true believers in the visible church, but within the visible church there are also fools. We call them hypocrites. They have the outward form, they have the outward lamp, they have church membership in a Christian church, but they don't have the inside. They don't have the oil. They don't have faith in Christ Jesus alone. So, these foolish maidens waiting for the groom to come, they represent those who have the outward formality of Christianity. They call themselves Christians. They think they're Christians, but they're not ready for the coming of the bridegroom because they don't have true faith in him as their only God and Savior. They think highly of Jesus, perhaps, but they don't do anything about it, and they don't believe that he is actually God and their only Savior who has died for all their sins and earned heaven for them as a free gift. But the five wise maidens that are waiting for the bridegroom to come, they have the oil, and the oil is faith. They have true faith in Jesus. These are the true believers within the visible church. They truly believe in Jesus as their God, their creator, and their only savior. And they put all their hope and trust in Jesus. They believe his word, every word of it. And they show it in their lives. Every day of their life, every moment of their life, they live for Jesus. They live with trust in him. They are, as the Bible says, they are in Christ. Not just on Sunday morning. Not just every now and then, but every day. They love his word. They read his word daily. They have devotionals every day in prayer. And they're not just formal Christians like the foolish maids, not just outward church membership, but in private, not in front of other people as a show, but in private they love Jesus. And they love the true triune God, and they read their Bible, and they pray, and they talk to other people about God and Jesus, their Savior. They have a lamp, but they also have the oil inside. But the foolish church members... They just have the outward lamp, the outward show of Christianity. The Bible puts it this way, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Well, getting back to Jesus' parable, the bridegroom is delayed. He doesn't come during the daytime, as maybe the uh, bride and her friends were expecting. And the sun sets, and it gets late. And the maidens become sleepy. 
and it gets on towards midnight. But suddenly, there comes a cry from outside, as it says in verse 6, Suddenly, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Suddenly. And all the maidens wake up, and they think they're ready for the big event, and immediately the foolish maidens have trouble with their lamp. They try to light their lamps, but they can't. But the wise maidens, they instantly have a beautiful flame, and they go out calm, collected, and joyful to meet the groom. But the fools, they're running around, realizing they're out of oil, and they don't know what to do. They call the wise ones, as it says in verse 8, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Wise maidens, however, tell the foolish ones that if the wise ones divided their oil, then no one would have enough. The only way to get oil, they say, you have to provide it for yourself in verse 9. Not so, lest there not be enough for us and for you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Go and get it like we did. When we were alive on earth, we sought God, we read the Bible, we went to church, we trusted in Jesus Christ as our God and our Creator and our Savior. We did it. Everybody has to do it for themselves. You can't do it for someone else. What's the meaning of this? Why does Jesus tell us this? Well, he's telling us his return, his second coming, will be delayed. It'll be a long time from the betrothal. And how long? He doesn't tell us. We don't know. We don't know when our bridegroom will come for us. But we know this. It will happen suddenly. As Jesus says here. Suddenly he will return. And then he will take at that instant... All true believers in him, all of his true disciples, to that great, eternal, heavenly, joyous feast. But then it will be too late for the others. It will be too late even for many church members who will then see that they lacked faith. True faith in Jesus. Oh, they had the outward church membership but not true faith in Jesus as their God and Savior. All they had was the outward shell, the outward form of religion. And then they will not be able to count on anyone else giving them their faith. Your family cannot give you faith. Your friends cannot give you faith in Jesus. Your fellow church members cannot give you of their faith in Jesus. Your pastor cannot give you faith in Jesus. You must, as it says here, apply yourself. You must seek God yourself. You must apply yourself to the Bible. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must do that yourself, for yourself. Well, Jesus finishes the parable. He says, the five wise maidens are prepared. They're ready. Whenever the bridegroom comes, they're ready. Whether it's early or late. And they go with the bridegroom to the great wedding feast just as planned. Meanwhile, the five foolish maidens run around frantically all over town looking for a place that's open at midnight to get oil. But all the shops are closed. So they run instead to the groom's house, groping in the dark, and they finally pound on the door uh, of where the wedding feast is being held inside. In verse 11, they, they cry out outside the house, they cry out, Lord, Lord, open to us. You can kind of picture the groom, he comes to the door and he opens that little window in the door, you know. He looks out 
sees these five foolish maidens there in the dark. And these maidens have let him down. They've let him down. They weren't ready for the wedding. And so he says to them in verse 12, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Jesus is saying here, no mad scramble on the last day will make up for foolishness now. The scriptures will then be closed to you forever. No more church, no more Bible. They'll be closed. God will be out of reach of your prayers forever. The gates of heaven will be closed forever. Now, the problem is, a lot of people today think, oh, uh, Christ isn't coming today. Uh, he's probably not coming in the next week or two. In fact, he's probably not coming soon at all. So, I've got plenty of time. I don't have to get into the Bible today. I don't have to go to church today. I don't have to seek God today. I don't have to get oil for my lamp today. I've got plenty of time. But Jesus closes off the parable by saying, in verse 13, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Jesus is warning everyone, don't wait. Don't wait. Because you don't know when the bridegroom is coming. It could be today. Even if you're a member of a church, do you have oil in your lamp? Have you added faith, true saving faith in God himself as your Savior, your only Savior? And do you show it in your daily life by loving him? Above all things, loving his word, putting all your faith and trust in him alone. Get some oil. Watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man, that's Jesus, cometh. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all of man's understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.